Welcome back to a complete history of Manchester United. I'm your host, Wayne Barton, author and producer of several Manchester United books and films. And I am, as always, joined by the legendary football writer, retired journalist Paddy Barclay, and who will be joining me on the, the trip down Old Trafford history um, and memory lane and all that sort of stuff and the good the good stuff that comes with it and the bad stuff as we will yeah. eventually navigate that as well. Um, if you're watching the video, give it a like and subscribe and join in the conversation in the comment section. If you're listening back to us on the audio podcast, please be sure to subscribe and give us a review on the platform you're listening on. And if you are listening back on the audio, it's always worthwhile going and checking the videos because obviously we put a lot of graphics up on the screen and sometimes we'll be referring to the graphics that are on there as well. We do try to make sure that we're referencing those in the actual show, um, but it's not always the case. Um, so it's good to check out the audio and the video at the same time. Well, the video, if you listen on the audio. Um, in the last episode, we looked at the 48-49 season, which was another runners-up for Busby and United in the league. This time around, we're going to look at the 49-50 campaign, uh, taken into a new decade, the 1950s. And Manchester United were a team for the future, of course. Uh, and this campaign would actually end with um, Busby really trying to pioneer United's future ambitions as well. Uh, but early in the season, Paddy, John Anderson transferred out. Um, mm-hmm. He's had a couple of years in the side, really about 18 months, really, uh, yep. where he's come to side and helped out. Uh, but he's gone to well, Nottingham Forest. Certainly made his mark. Yeah, gone to Forest and certainly made his mark on United history by being by coming into the team in this season that that really gave Busby's first great team its name, the 48 team. And and scoring a goal and playing very well in the uh, FA Cup, the classic FA Cup final, 1948. But that's uh, John Anderson gone. Um, maybe, you know, not quite up to the the standard of uh, of some of the players around him. Yeah, um, as we talked about last time as well, Johnny Morris also gone. Um, yeah. Another um, identification of Busby's... Um, I for a decline really that he, because Morris was dropped from the England team this season as well. So it wasn't just that there was the there was the um the disagreement that they had on the training ground, but yeah. we'd also sort of perhaps indicated that he would have to make that change anyway. Well it's it's interesting that because there was no sign of anything other than brilliance in Morris, uh his his creative play, his tackling mm-hmm. even would have gladdened the eye of Jimmy Murphy. Um, and yet, he and he went to Derby for a record, Derby County for a record fee. And in the summer of '49, it was a brief England career, a meteorite almost. You know, he he came into the side, scored on his debut in Norway, uh, got another couple in France. Um, this is in the summer of '49, and and it looks like a great England career is born. Uh, his next match is against the Repu- uh, against the Republic of Ireland with Johnny Carey, United captain, also captaining Ireland. And and history is made because uh, the match was played at Goodison Park, and this was the first time England lost in England, not at Wembley, but in England. And uh, uh, well, whatever Morris did uh, in that game, or in his relations with the other players, his performance in training, whatever, never played for England again. So, it, uh, as you say, the, the Morris's career, it, it, I wouldn't say it fizzled out. Um, he, he continued to play, he have a good and long career, but uh, the greatness that was forecast for him never quite materialised. No, he was um, replaced in the short term by a lad called Tommy Bogan. We'll come into him a little ah, bit later on in the. Can I just show. give a? Can I just tell you something on a personal note? When of I course. started working in newspapers in Manchester, way way back in the late 1960s, Tommy Bogan was working in the case room. The printer. He was a printer, and uh, and uh, very much one of the lads. So. Uh, I have a great fondness for Tommy Bogan. Brilliant. We'll, uh, we'll talk about his contribution to United in, in a short yeah. while yeah. as we go through the squad summary as always. 
Um, so the season relay back at Old Trafford. The season started well. Um, the first game back at Old Trafford, they won against Bolton 3 0. I'm going to put up a graphic now on the screen of the crowds outside Old Trafford queuing for tickets, which mm. is just incredible. Um, um, and then they, a couple of weeks later, they win 2 1 against Manchester City. Just two defeats in the first 19 league games. Um, United really started the season well. One of those games is against Sunderland. Uh, it was the first defeat at Old Trafford. I'm just going to mm. put up a couple of graphics here. First of all, of the United review uh, from that game and the, the team lineup. We, we usually show the tactics later on, and I will be doing that again, but you'll see how they lined up in the program there. This is the, the team that was um, facing Sunderland that day. Um, the famous uh, reference from a Sunderland point of view is that it was the first of five wins in a row at Old Trafford, mm. and so they really made hay there. Um, mm. Nonetheless, United did recover Paddy. They scored goals. They played thrilling football. In fact, for a long time in 1950, it looked as though Busby would deliver his first league title. Yeah, uh, They were top in the early part of the year, and then there was this landmark result against Aston Villa where um, they really played some great football and included an unusual hat-trick from Charlie Mitter. Yes, it did. Um, I mean, Charlie Charlie Mitten was a great penalty taker, and uh, but it looked like he had a bit of a challenge on his hand in the Villa game because um, when United did get a penalty, the Villa goalkeeper Joe Rutherford um, was in incredible form. He'd saved two penalties, two penalties at Everton, but of course he now came up against the master. Uh, and Charlie Mitten, cheeky as ever, put the ball on the on the spot, stepped back four paces and just pinged the ball past the keeper. It hit the upper part of the stanchion to Rutherford's left, bounced out. United get another penalty, same thing, ping off the stanchion and Rutherford's beaten again. So next time the keeper, there's a third penalty and, ne and next time the keeper decides a little gamesmanship so while Charlie's placing the ball, he goes up to him and he says, where's this one going, Charlie? Where's it, where's it going this time, Charlie? It's a bit of a, you know, working on the law of averages and all that kind of stuff. Charlie says, same place. And uh, ping, <laughs> back down off the stanchion. So I had triggered penalties, all pinged off the same stanchion. Uh, that's, that was typical of, of Charlie Mitt and uh, the sheer high school confidence of the guy. Um, epitomised. Yeah, um, United win 7-0, Mitten adds another goal in that uh, four, and at that point it does look like they're going to win the title, that's early March, but they have a, a, a what you call it a capitulation of sorts really, there's four, five defeats in the next sort of eight or nine games, mm -hmm. they're really hurt by having to switch goalkeepers in the running, they're also having problems um, scoring, and yeah. um, when it comes to welcoming Portsmouth in the sort of crunch game at Old Trafford yeah. in mid-April, um, Crompton's back in goal, but unfortunately mm -hmm. they're hurt by losing both of the fullbacks, Kerry and Aston are out, and they have to play McNulty and Ball. Yeah. Ball, people will remember from earlier episodes, McNulty will introduce in this. Um, so it was a difficult day, really. Portsmouth won 2 0 Paddy, and um, yes. Yeah. Well, it was it, it, absolutely Portsmouth um, were one of four contenders, I would say, at, still um, at this day. United, uh, obviously, um, Arsenal, Wolves, you know, the usual suspects at that time. But Portsmouth doing very well in the post war period. And um, the uh, Aston and Kerry weren't injured. It was an international day. And yeah. in those days, as, as many. Of yeah. the historians listening will will know the um, you know you were weakened by international rather like club rugby players now you you you're weakened by international calls on the same day as your league match and this was the case when as you say Ball and McNulty instead of Aston and Kerry lined up against Portsmouth and it it proved a a, a costly um, uh, depletion in this case because Portsmouth were a good side. Yeah, um, Portsmouth won 2 0. Crucial title um, defining result, really, because it went back to Fratton Park. They were, of course, the current holders at the time. United mm. um, continued their poor run of form by losing 2 1 at Newcastle, 
which yeah. they secured their fate. Um, they finished fourth in the end, which was a disappointing climax to a season, which had promised so much just about eight weeks earlier. Really yeah. did look like they were going to win the league. Um, the FA Cup also came with heartache in a sixth round defeat at Chelsea as well. Yeah. So, yeah, they'd beaten Portsmouth in the FA Cup, I think. Yeah, uh, and um, to just to go back, I, I don't like to interrupt, but the uh, to go back to the um. The league match against Portsmouth was you mentioned the fullback depletion, but um, it was also a record-breaking debutant uh, in oh, the yeah. game. Let's talk about him then. Uh, talk about the the circumstances because it was a record that was set then, and I, th- I believe it still stands today. Yeah, well, it was um, Jeff Whitefoot was a very very promising uh, wing half midfield player. Call him what you will, a uh, local boy from Cheadle. Um, and he joined at about the same time as Dennis Violet, another local boy. So, you know, he was still, you know, he was still, um, despite the supplanting of of uh, Louis Rocca with uh, Joe Armstrong as the head of, of, of scouting, um, with the intention of widening the net, they still like to get the very best of Manchester. And Jeff Whitefoot had been hugely coveted. Um, you know, all the clubs around about Manchester, including City, City, according to Jeff Whitefoot, uh, when I spoke to him for my book about Matt Busby, uh, Jeff told me that Man City had actually offered his dad a job um, for, quote, scouting services. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there was hot, hot competition uh, for Jeff Whitefoot, but Joe Armstrong won it for United. And Jeff Whitefoot uh, started work in the office um, with the secretary, Walter Crickman, and his assistant by now, uh, Les Olive, a man who was to play a very big part in Manchester United history over a very long time. And Jeff was the sort of office junior, you know, handing out tickets on match day and, and, and so on. But on a, this particular match day, when Portsmouth were the visitors, the day before, he was told, you can be in the first team. Um, and uh, because, you know, because of the international calls. And uh, he went, he stayed the night. Um, United thought about his pre-match nerves and thought he was 16 years, 100 and five days on the on the day of the match so 104 the day, day before the match he went he and dennis violet were taken to sleep at uh, jimmy murphy's house with <laughs> jeff remembered that he didn't get all that much sleep because of jimmy and his wife had five kids so it wasn't exactly the most peaceful uh, evening but they they did go um before they went back to bed they um they were taken to the hume hippodrome uh, for some entertainment again to try and take the mind off this big match, um, but uh, Whitefoot was said to have done okay in the game. He didn't let the side down, although uh, McNulty, the one of the two uh, substitute uh, replacement fullbacks, was faulted for the first of Portsmouth's two goals. Yeah, um, we'll talk about Jeff in a, again in a little moment. Um, the United. Um, Obviously, it was disappointing to finish in fourth uh, and, and to have the um, end in the FA Cup in the sixth round. Yeah, they also had the, a, the, 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 actually won the league, so yeah. you know, in a, in a sense, there's no no great disgrace in that defeat, especially with a weakened side, like say with a weakened side, players, yeah, exactly uh, coming in too well. Um, but yeah, a few problems. I mean, United lost more games than normal, um, as, as would be reflected in the fact that they dropped down the table. Also, scored um, quite significantly fewer number of goals this time around 69 and the conceding at a rate is still just about around a goal a game which is par for the course for United at the time um, so while the short term prospects Paddy were um, stalled for a little while you know they'd have to wait until the next season to go again um, Busby also had visions off the field um, he had all kinds of ideas of how he wanted to establish United as a, a presence in the game really and this was, as we'll come to in future episodes, um, married perfectly with the evolution of the game. But when mm. the game wasn't moving at the same pace, um, there was a post-season tour, wasn't there, really, that, that talks a lot about um, Busby's drive to push United into a, a greater global 
um, presence, really. Yes, yes. The tour was of uh, of of North America. It was a it was a very extensive one. It proved to be historic, as we will, as you say, deal with um, very shortly in in further as the as the series moves on. Um, but yes, um, it was a it was an extensive tour of South America. Um, it took place also 1950. Um, people will know that that was a World Cup summer. Um, so there was, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of the, a few of the United players had, had thoughts of that as well as they ended the season. Um, United had current internationals such as Rowley, such as, um, uh, such as, um, well, who were the, who were the others have been at that time? Uh, uh, Aston. Aston, you know, these were all players looking forward to the world uh, to the World Cup. Yeah, it was a, it was a momentous summer, though, for more than the tour. And we'll talk about Louis Rocker's death. I'm, I'm sure in a couple of seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll run through the squad statistics then, as we um, usually do with the introduction of players. Um, Jack Crompton was a senior goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah yes, another just... goalkeeper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, We'll get onto the um, differing um, fortunes of these ones because it's quite funny, really, uh, when you look at the the numbers. Um, they give a different reflection on what, we, what yeah. you might expect. So Jack had suffered a, um, not his back injury that that had sort of been cleared up by the cup final and everything, but he, he was becoming more injury prone and suffered yes, a wrist was. injury that kept him out of fifteen games this season. And those fifteen games, first of all, Sonny Fian came in mm. and he played. Um, he played 12 league games really came in from waterford again um a short goalkeeper at 511 but it wasn't really a big deal at the time as we've covered in previous episodes this was a single season these 14 appearances came in all competitions 12 in the league as i said um another of the standings was a fella called joe lancaster mm. another of these one season wonders um he signed as a trainee in may 49 he was called into the side before he was even a professional and signed as a pro during his run of four appearances, um, which all came this season. Um, he kept two clean sheets in his first two against Chelsea and Watford, but then conceded two and three goals against Burnley and Portsmouth, uh, respectively. Portsmouth in the, in the cup game, which Paddy spoke about earlier. Mm. The um, fourth goalkeeper he used this season made one, one appearance a lad called Ray Wood Paddy, um, signed mm. from Hamilton. He'd already played 12 league appearances there, only 19 at the time, but a sign mm. of the confidence must be adding him to play. Only one yeah. appearance against Newcastle in December, but unlike Lancaster and Fihen, um, Wood would stick around. Yes, absolutely. Wood was to, was to have a major part in Manchester United history under, under Busby. Very, very gifted uh, goalkeeper, still young at this stage. Um, and the I the the fact that that Busby needed an experienced man was was it was shown when he made yet one more attempt to sign Frank Swift, but not from Manchester City. And it's a trick question, Wayne, and I, I feel ashamed to ask you. But uh, tell me, from whom he would have signed if if Busby had been successful in getting him? Well, uh, if Frank Swift. Any student of Manchester United worth their salt would have read your book on Sir Matt Busby. They would, <laughs> they would know that they tried to sign him from the news of the world. The news of the world. Frank Swift had retired from Manchester City and become a journalist on the news of the world. Um, and um, Matt offered him compensation to come out of retirement and play. For, he was 36 by now. And he politely declined because uh, I mean Ray Wood was to become uh, regular um, and, and was obviously had promise, but Matt still felt that he needed someone to tide him through for the the many occasions where where Jack Crompton um, was cropped. Yeah, um, club captain Johnny Carey made thirty eight appearances, forty three in all competitions with yep. one league goal. Um, John Aston made. Uh, 40 appearances, 45 in all competitions. The fullbacks uh, backups were John Ball with 13 appearances, Tommy Lowry with three appearances, Sammy Lynn with 10 appearances, and um, Tom McNulty, who made 
the first two of his 60 appearances for the club. Um, we'll talk about his very special place in United history a little bit later on. Um, but Tom McNulty, um, fullback, played a couple of appearances here in this season. Um, in the halfback line, um, although you, as we've said in previous episodes, Alan B. Chilton was more of a conventional centre half, um, centre back. Mm-hmm. Even he yeah. played thirty five appearances, uh, fourteen all competitions with one league goal. Henry Coburn, uh, exactly the same record: forty appearances in all competitions, thirty five in the league, and one goal. Billy McGlenn in the halfback line, thirteen yeah. appearances and fourteen in all competitions. And um, Jack Warner, who would usually play there um, in place of Anderson, who was now moved on, was 25 appearances in all competitions and 21 in the league, which brings us on to some of the um, peripheral squad members who came into the side. Jeff Whitefoot, as we earlier yeah. mentioned, he made just that one appearance, that record-breaking appearance, record-breaking and record-making, really, uh, which has stood the test of time. Um, really, you would say, in... in addition to Ray Wood, the first of what would be described as the Busby Babes because of mm-hmm. um, the, the way that they were being integrated into the side. Right. Right. Um, yeah, as Paddy's already described, the, the story of him signing there, uh, a real strong example of that scouting system at United coming into uh, mm. fruition already. Um, mm. Brian they- Burke, Sorry, I c- carry on. I'll give you one. Uh, when you've finished going through the squad, I'll give you one one player one player who became very famous who busby didn't land busby and armstrong didn't land but carry on with the squad because this is yeah sure um brian birch one appearance uh, one of his 15. um his third game he played in the third game against west brom he was only 17 but busby was yeah. reconfiguring that forward line diminutive lad at five foot six uh, better days to come but just a single appearance um, this season Tommy Bogan, as we've already mentioned earlier in yeah. the um, episode, so he, he came into the side, um, signed in the summer. He's, he played 18 league games, scored four goals, 22 games in all appearances this season. Um, and the forward line also um, included the likes of Ted Buckle, who we've mentioned in previous episodes. He scored seven, oh, he played seven times, didn't score a goal. And then we go into the famous front um, line of, um, you know, Rowley and so on. So Rowley was top scorer again, 23 goals in all competitions, 39 appearances, and um, 20 of those goals were in the league. 39 of the appearances were in the league. Stan Pearson, obviously a great goal scorer and an inside forward of, of esteemed class, scored 15 goals in 41 appearances, 17 in 45 in all competitions. And Charlie Mitten's hat trick and four goals in fights against Aston Villa were four of 19 in 47 in all competitions, 16 in 42 in the league. Jimmy Delaney, that um, fantastic winger, six goals in 47, but many more provided um, for, for the inside uh, forwards and centre forwards like Rowley, Mitten, Pearson, and John Downey, who scored seven in 20. Mm. six in 18 in the league and and the forward line is completed by the introduction of frank clemson a forward um, a versatile player really because he was an inside forward or wing off um, another local lad coming through the ranks with just a single appearance this season at inside forward as i mentioned roley was the the top scorer and the attendance record for the season was 42,064 as United got used to playing Old Trafford again. Uh, Paddy mentioned the uh, player that United failed to get other than Frank Swift. Yes, absolutely. But around the same time that uh, Joe Armstrong was, uh, you know, netting such notables uh, from the local ranks as Dennis Violet and, um, and Jeff Whitefoot, uh, another young player was uh, busby was alerted to another young player this was an outside left a, a wiry winger um in, by the name of brian statham very very uh, promising outside left um but his dad wanted him to pursue a, a cricketing career and it's just as well of course because as every sports fan uh, ought to know Brian Statham went on to become one of England's greatest fast bowlers of all time, forming uh, a partnership with Freddie Truman uh, of Yorkshire. So the Lancashire York, he played for Lancashire, Lancashire Yorkshire combination that became one of the greatest 
uh, fast bowling partnerships in the world and is still renowned. Um, so Brian Statham probably made a, a good decision there, though. Who knows uh, that he could have uh, he could have become uh, United's outside left in succession uh, to uh, to Charlie Mitten. Yeah, and um, if he'd had the um, testitude of um, a player like Arnie Sidebottom, he could have done both. Mm. But uh, Arnie Sidebottom is a name for the future uh, of this uh, podcast. Uh, go through the tactics. Um, again, the position by position run is the same. I've put Warner in it, um, yeah, and halfback, and he, he was him mostly, but also well, he, he must have been cracking on by then, Jack Warner. Heavens, yeah, he must have been 37, 38 by now. Yeah, but, obviously, uh, he had to come in because of Anderson's departure, you know, United, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Downey again. We mentioned Downey, but it's just as likely that that's um, no. Tommy Bogan's yeah. place as well. Yeah. So, Downey, who, who was bought to replace. Uh, Morris, but uh, never quite. Maybe injuries didn't help, but uh, yes, he, he he made enough appearances and scored enough goals to, to justify his place in that team. Yeah, yeah. Um, the United review, as we mentioned earlier, remained the same with Anshake at the top. The colours again were red, white, and black at home, as they, they will be throughout the series. There's only one ever yeah. um, amendment to that: um, blue, white, and um, black socks away from home. They, they did have a change in the previous season with Blue Sox, but they've um, gone back to Black Sox now. Um, the key results, as I, I put up a slide from the, um, I put up a slide from the gaming, well, one of the games in the America Tour there, the American League yeah. All-Stars. Um, that's a squad picture, which I'll, I'll put up a bigger splash of the squad picture as well in a moment. But the key results this season... And we're defeating Bolton Old Trafford in the first home game um, after returning from Main Road. Defeating Portsmouth in, away in the cup to prove their standard. And the 7 0 win over Aston Villa. And obviously the 2 0 defeat to Portsmouth was a key result as well. Um, elsewhere, then, Paddy, in, in this season, as we always do a quick summary of what was happening in British football. Portsmouth did retain the goal difference, uh, the, the title on goal average, sorry, from Wolves. Um, in in the league elsewhere, Manchester City were relegated, which um, would have been to the delight of um, many Manchester United fans. Although the rivalry wasn't quite as strong, it was quite friendly back in those days. Um, mm. Arsenal were the FA Cup winners, and as you mentioned, Paddy, um, perhaps we'll talk about the significance of this in future episodes. But in July 1950. Uh, the passing of Louis Rocker right at the moment where the discoveries of his successor were about to start making waves. Yes, I, I, absolutely. And, and But, of course, Louis Rocker's funeral uh, in the summer of 1950 was, as you say, a very um, significant affair in the history of Manchester United. And this was shown. He was, he was only 67, Louis Rocker, but he'd still given way over half a century's service to Manchester United and before that Newton Heath. Um, there was a requiem mass at his old church in Ancoats. The body was taken to St Joseph's Cemetery in Moston and buried in the presence of Man United staff, supporters and players past and present, um, including Billy Meredith, who um, was, was, was one of the, the greats of the early days. And as his coffin was lowered, um, a little square of the Old Trafford turf was laid on top appropriately. Um, and that was, so that was um, Louis Rocca uh, gone, but never to be forgotten. Absolutely not. And um, if there's one thing that I hope has come across in these first few episodes of this series is just how important Louis' contribution was to Manchester United. And, I always find that um, there, in football as in life, there are weird sort of little coincidences. And I always found it a little bit weird and touching that Louis passed just before the fruits of his labor were really, you know, were, they mm. bloomed into something that they couldn't have imagined. Similar in a way to the way that Jimmy Murphy and Matt Busby passed away just before United became yeah. this machine yeah. in the late 90s but life is like that and um no one at old trafford was going to forget what louis rocker had done for them that's for sure even if there remained some contention about uh, whether or not he did give the club its name 
but um, <laughs> well, we'll give him that one. He, he did plenty more besides, even if he didn't do that. Um, yeah, if you're watching this video, please do give it a like and subscribe and join in the conversation in the comment section. If you're listening to the audio podcast, please do be sure to subscribe and give us a review on the platform you're listening on. Thanks for watching and listening. And we will be back next time to talk about um, another landmark season in the history of United as the integration of the Busby Babes gathers pace.